There we go. Whee! Sorry, just rearranging my gallery. Thank you. Okay, so you can see that. So spotting and supporting mental health in the workplace, basically what we're looking at, going to look at is how to make a difference. And so I have loads of slides on here. So I'm going to start with the really boring, dry stuff. And I know some people absolutely adore stats. So we'll meet the needs of the people who uh, need the stats and the numbers first. Um, the first two on the top left, the one in four and the one in six, uh, surprisingly have actually been quite stable for quite a long period of time, regardless of what's happening in the economy. And that one in four people will experience some form of mental health issue in any one year. And at any one time, one in six working age adults have symptoms associated with mental ill health, but are not necessarily diagnosed. And that's part of the challenge because attitudes, long-term historical um, around anything to do with mental health stuff. Um, oh, yeah, can I talk about this? And then we'll, we'll get people who view anything to do with mental health as a, a character flaw or a weakness. Um, and therefore, they don't want to talk about it, they internalize it. And then we have, um, not picking on the gentleman in the room here, but we have this general, the, the generalized uh, testosterone charged or men don't talk about mental health. You know, big boys don't cry. Um, what's it? Uh, pull yourself together, mate. Uh, you know, that kind of attitude that comes with it. And that really doesn't help um, because the bottom line is we all have mental health. And if we go back to 1947, when the World Health Organization came into being, they needed a definition of health. And their definition of health has three aspects to it. One is physical health, one is mental health, and one is social health. And what's interesting is you look at the impact that those three have on us as individuals, and people, you know, the overlap between physical and mental health, I think a lot of us can get. Because if you take a person's physical health, we often know that their mental health suffers as well. Take a person who's, I don't know, um, laid off work because of a physical health issue, they often develop depression. It, it just it's one of those things that happens. Put a person into a wheelchair following a motorbike accident or a car accident or so, something like that. And they often struggle through long periods of depression because their physical health has been impacted. And it has a knock-on effect on the mental health. Well, if we want to look at what's happened with the World Health Organization's definition, um, the fact that that social health leg, uh, let's just talk about what happened in lockdown. And the it was interesting that the statistics in April 2020, about 74% of people said they were coping and they were doing okay under the circumstances. So first lockdown, about five, six weeks in. We go forward 10 months to February 2021 and only 64 people, 64% 64 of people said that they were coping in the same way they had 10 months earlier. That is a huge change in the statistics. And let, let's try and put this into, into context. We go back to how things started. Um, before COVID started, we had Brexit. So we've had Brexit, then we've had COVID. Then we had this incredibly unstable government where we jumped from uh, Mr. Johnson to Ms. Truss to uh, Mr. Uh, blank. Sunak. Mr. Sunak, thank that you. Man, that was... memorable. <laughs> <laughs> no. I knew it started with an S, but I couldn't remember the rest of it. I told you my brain's fried for today. But we, we, we look about the impact that, that that had on our economy. Now we're looking at the fact that there's a war in the Ukraine and everything's compounding. And it's, it's, we're going through a session of layer upon layer upon layer. Um, I'm on record as saying that it will probably, t it would probably take us 10 years to get over Brexit. Never mind everything else that's happened. What's that going to take us to get over? So, yeah, we are going through difficult times. Um, so just to put things into perspective again, the, the bottom left-hand stat, the 2019, 2018 to 2019, there were over 600,000 cases of work-related stress. There's around about 35 million people working in the UK, and that's between the ages of 16 and 64. That's the, the approximate official stats, uh, a 35 million figure, okay? The cost of mental ill health to the economy, and this is a Mental Health Foundation and London Stock Exchange um, research that was done up to March this year, was 118 billion in one year to our fiscus. That is a serious amount of money. If we then start looking at, let's get it tied closer to home, 
mental ill health responsible for 72 million working days lost. And it costs employers 45 billion. So let's do a bit of number crunching here. That's around about 1300 pounds per employee. So let's start thinking about the businesses that you uh, run, own, the ones you're associated with. Think about the number of employees and let's start thinking about the impact that poor mental health's having on them. You, um, there's five of us in the room, well, one and a quarter of us is possibly experiencing some form of mental health issue this year. We are all working age adults. One in six will have symptoms associated with mental ill health. So this is, brings it really right home. And if we can get people to talk more about mental health, because it's a common topic, we all have mental health. That's the importance of the World Health Organization's definition of health. When we use the phrase health, we generally speaking talk about physical health, not mental health. But when we talk about health, we should be talking about physical health, mental health, and social health. So again, when people talk about health, we need to start saying, hang on a minute, which, which element of health are you talking about? Which leg of this health uh, stool um, is important to you at, at this time? The language around mental health is often very negative very stressful and there's an awful lot of very negative words uh, there but the phrase mental health itself in actual fact is neither positive nor negative it's neutral but in the media it is used more negatively than positively and that in its own right is a bit of a challenge because again when you know I, I'm, I've been known to yell at the BBC uh, news going the man running the, 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 the reporter has just told us very eloquently uh, with their RP pronunciation that the man in running down the street had mental health and my response to that comment is far too rude to repeat in the polite company in this room um, no kidding okay but we all have mental health based on the definition of health there is no health without mental health and what's interesting is that those of us who own businesses, if you have five or more employees in your business, you are required by law to have somebody trained in physical first aid. That's a legal requirement. And yet you are six times more likely to encounter someone experiencing poor mental health than someone needing physical first aid in our businesses. And for that reason, um, the organization that accredits me, Mental Health First Aid England, is very much involved in uh, supporting a private member's bill to get mental health first aid recognized on parity with physical first aid. So if you want to, if you imply, employ five or more people in your business, do yourself a favor, start thinking about how you can incorporate mental health awareness, mental health knowledge, well-being training into your, into your business. Uh, if you want to spread the, the, the cost load, and to be honest, all I need to do is stop one person leaving your company to pay for the cost of a mental health first aid course and you've actually made a profit out of me on that basis so the training's not expensive it's giving it the priority it needs to enable it to happen this picture i uh cribbed off the internet um it gives us oh and by the way i am totally happy to share my slide deck um or a pdf of the slide deck with rob afterwards to share with everybody no problem at all okay so what a lot of people don't realize is that they often think of mental health, oh, it affects the mind, but it doesn't. It affects the body, it affects the emotions, it affects the behavior. It, it impacts every part of us that we wish to believe exists, okay? And stress is another way of talking about mental health. There are three um, words that we can use interchangeably. A lot of people, you hear the word mental health and, ooh, it's that topic, a mm, bit uncomfortable about that. But I bet you'll talk about well-being, no problem at all. And people will discuss how much stress they're experiencing quite comfortably because stress is something we're all familiar with. But when we talk about stress, we're actually talking about mental health as well. Three slides here coming up all related to signs of poor mental health in the workplace. So let's think about sources of stress. Stress can be physical. So that could be physically in the body. But it could also be the stress that we experience from sitting in front of a computer all day. That builds up stress in us in, in our physical bodies. Um, it could be health issues. So, for example, not getting enough sleep, poor diet, lack of physical activity. How about environmental stress? Now, 
the, the the green environment around us is part of this. You'll notice I have Peter palm tree over here, and there's a spider plant over where is it? there it is there um, that that I've got plants in my office because I know they improve the environment in my office here. But let's also talk about the environment where, where people live in. Let's talk about people who are living in um, in slum uh, slum type properties, uh, overcrowded, um, damp, mold violence on the street, gangs on the street, low socioeconomic communities. And we wonder about the environments they're living in. Uh, let's think about the environments that our young people go to school in and how they're coping, for example, with all, all the teacher strikes, you know, and the impact that that's having on them. Let's throw in a layer of children with learning difficulties um, or uh, developmental differences and 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 talk about what's happening with them and their mental health because of all the change that they're being forced to accept. Emotional sources of stress, that is, think about that directly as interpersonal relationships in any form. So whether it's at work, at home, whether it's family, friends, colleagues, peers, uh, the snotty neighbor next door, um, the, 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 the bully who's uh, pushed his car um, out and stolen your parking, you know, anything like that can come into that one. Acute life events, that can be, that, that's a number of things. So, for example, a divorce, a bereavement, changing your job, going on holiday, getting married, buying a new house. Any of those are acute life events. Uh, getting a diagnosis of what, will, what you know will be a long-term physical health issue, that's acute life event because that's a huge shock to you when you receive that news. Chronic stress is anything... Chronic uh, comes from the Greek chronos that relates to time and chronic stress is stress over a long period of time. So it could be any one of those um, issues that we're not able to resolve and therefore the stress for that's going to be with us for a long period of time. I've mentioned the recent big events, so I'm not going to belabor um, any time on that, but Brexit, COVID, the government, war in the Ukraine, economic issues that people are experiencing. And to be honest, a very uncertain outcome going on in the future. Elaine, you've mentioned a, a rise in, in certain types of company going uh, bust at the moment. Um, and that doesn't surprise me in light of everything that people are dealing with. Physically actually in the workplace um, are the issues we're, get, we're going to cover next. Um, attendance, this is people going to work, pitching up for work. We have this um, absenteeism, which companies can easily uh, register, you know, either a person's at work, logged in work today, or they've hopefully phoned in, not texted in, and they've pulled a sickie. Um, but often they won't say it's, you know, I'm feeling overwhelmed, I'm stressed out. What they'll say is, um, I had too much to drink last night, I need to take a day off, or I need to take a sick day, or come down with a migraine headache, or, oh, I had a dodgy takeaway last night, I'm going at both, it's, oh, sorry, got to go. You know, that kind of response. Um, people generally speaking, when they, they take a duvet day uh, because of me poor mental health, it's anything else but poor mental health because of the attitude that businesses take towards people with poor mental health. We also then have presenteeism, and these are people who are at work who shouldn't be at work. So people, for example, um, who know they've got COVID and who kept working, okay, um, and, and, and shared COVID with their employees. One, they're too embarrassed to admit they had COVID. Two, um, oh, well, it's just like flu, get, get it and get over it. Okay, tell that to the 100,000 100, plus people who died from COVID. Um, presenteeism, people who are emotionally overloaded, overwhelmed, and really should just take some time off, you know, compassionate leave, that kind of thing, for whatever reason. We tend to have this very strong, um, it, it, it's known as the Protestant work ethic, where we will work when we're practically, you know, and we're really you know almost on death's door we'll keep going till we have to stop generally speaking how do we put a value to those two well if you can rate if you can calculate your absenteeism rate in other words you know they're not there they're not working okay if you you can actually put a take an average salary in a company and put a value to that because we know you know you can it's fairly easy to work out what the average salary cost is the absenteeism rate is one times that. You want to know what your presenteeism rate, you can double it. 
So the total cost to a business of absenteeism plus presenteeism is three times average salary for one person for one day. And then you work out that times the number of days that people are missing. And you can put a real time value on the cost of poor mental health to a business. And that becomes just a, a shocking figure. Leavism, I'm told, I'm not a legal eagle. I'm told that leavism is actually illegal. Um, I need to do a bit of research on that one. Leavism is where we take holiday, but we take our work with us. And yeah, we finish off the report. We do whatever we need to do. Now, I'm told it's illegal. How often do we know? Now, those of us who are self-employed, leavism, what's that? We do that all the time. You know, I, I challenge anybody here that is self-employed, you, you, that you're able to walk out of your business and not worry about your email for an entire week. Okay, I can't do it. I'm not in that position yet. You know, maybe one day I'll have a, um, a very clever virtual PA who'll, watch, who'll run my emails for me. I haven't got there yet. Um, but we need to do that. But think about corporates where people are in, uh, that they, they have official job descriptions, et cetera, but there's, they, they are not allowed to actually enjoy their holiday because they're expected to keep an eye on emails, reports, deadlines, KPIs, et cetera, while they're away. Not a good plan. And we wonder why people are getting stressed out and struggling at work with overwhelm. Let's talk about timekeeping in the workplace. Poor timekeeping. Poor timekeeping normally means they're in late, they go home early, or they're skiving off somewhere. Okay, sorry, skiving off, they're not at work. Skiving is a good South African word for just not being there, okay? So, however, there is another side to timekeeping. What about the so-called workaholic? What about the person who comes in early and goes home late because their home life is so difficult, so stressful that, that staying at work, they'd rather be at work crunching out stuff for the boss than going home and dealing with the reality of being at home. So when we see people's, when we see a change in people's behavior in terms of their timekeeping, we need to start asking a few questions. Hang on a minute. What's going on here? In terms of personal things, personal stuff that's happening. And again, here we're looking at changes in behavior. You know, previously, they always seem to be bright and chirpy. And recently, in recent weeks, recent months, all they're talking about is tiredness and fatigue. What's going on? What's changed? There may be people who say they get plenty of sleep, but they're getting poor quality sleep. Or they may, doesn't matter how much sleep they get, they're still tired. Which suggests that they're either not getting good quality sleep or something's, that something's playing around in the back of their mind and they're worrying. Weight gain or weight loss. I happen to be uh, one of those people who will come for eat. And I, I know that I'm getting stressed out uh, over job when I start snacking, although it's popping down to the cake shop down the road, um, or, or or start swearing. That's the other one. That doesn't help the weight, though. Okay, I might swear about the weight, but I know that those are two things that, in me personally, that will tell me that um, something's going on in my stress container. And we'll come to the stress container shortly. Emotional irritability, anger. Okay, these we may see in the workplace. People do something and you're sending a chi whiz, I didn't see that coming. That was a change of behavior. Well, that's not like them. Wow. We see another aspect to them that we weren't expecting. We may also see an increase in addictions, substance abuse. And in that, please include things like gambling and retail therapy, aka shopping. Okay. In terms of performance in the workplace, KPIs will be missed, they'll miss deadlines, they'll not do their reports on time, uh, they're supposed to be in meetings and they're not, they're not there. There's various issues in terms of KPIs, key performance indicators. They may lose track with what's happening. So you, they, 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 they could generally speak to me, one of those people who has the capability to spin a lot of plates. And suddenly it's they've lost touch with what's happening here. And what you're hearing in their, in their conversation is, oh, I need to check on that. Oh, I need to check, I'll get back to you. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. That's a symbol of stress. Inability to focus is another one where they get distracted. Um, people who describe feeling overwhelmed, line managers who make poor or no decisions because they can't make a decision can be a challenge. 
In terms of conduct, we could look in, in a department in a, in a business and somebody might say that the staff morale in that department has dropped. Well, what's going on? Is there somebody in that department who's pulling the staff morale down, who's sucking the life out of the individuals that they don't want to be there? Is the line manager in that department the person who's struggling? And they're taking their, their, their struggle, they're taking it out on individuals in that department. Issues with interpersonal relationships, people who usually cooperate and are, I don't use the word compliant because that makes them sound like a pushover, but they, they get with it. And suddenly there's been a change. They don't, they don't get with it anymore. They may be the people who, um, in terms of cooperation, they're the ones who we know we can go to because we know that they'll get on board and they'll help us and they'll be supportive. And suddenly they can't be asked. And that can't be asked. The ask could be spelled A-S-K-E-D or A-R-S-E-D because they can't be asked. Okay. They've got too much other stuff going on in their own life, so they're not getting involved with that. We may also see an increase in safety issues, such as near misses or risk taking. People who, um, for example, uh, I've been in sales management. One of the things I always used to keep, keep an eye on was speeding tickets and parking tickets. Because sometimes, you know, if, if they can't be, can't be bothered or aren't paying attention or feeling overwhelmed, that, that the foot on the accelerator could get a little bit heavy. That tells us something else that's going on. Um, accidents in the workplace, in the record book. Are the accidents actually being recorded or can't they be bothered? Does it not matter? Um, so things like that could come into it. So there's a lot of little bits and pieces that feed into in a number of different areas in the workplace that gives us indications that there is an individual who may be struggling and maybe it's time to have a one-to-one -one conversation with them about where they're at and what's happening. So let's talk about this thing called a stress container. Now, do you think that everybody has the same ability to cope with stress? I'm so glad you're shaking your head there. Okay, so let's think this as a stress container. Okay, I can put a whole lot of stuff in here. I can put pens and paper clips and fill it up and overflow it. And I can even once it appears to be full, pour some water in or some liquid in and fill it up some more. And this as a stress container it could be completely full to the point of overflowing. But this is one person's stress container. If I bring this stuff down, this one down, I could pull the contents of the smaller glass into the bigger glass. And this stress container is quite comfortable because the stress level in here is up to there. And this, this person with this size stress, con size stress container has the ability to cope with more stress. One of the easiest ways for us to grow our stress container is by developing a reflective practice as a manager. What worked, what didn't work, and what am I gonna do differently next time I face this situation? And a lot of us with managers, we go, okay, um, it's fallen apart over here, just get on and do the next thing and we move on. We don't take the time to stop and go, well, what worked, what didn't work? What should I do differently next time? Because that's, that's where we learn. So let's have a look at this. We all have this stress container. I'm using a triangle because it's a convenient um, symbol. The size of our stress container gives us an indication of how resilient we are or how vulnerable we are. Big stress container, more resilient. Small stress container, more vulnerable. Reflective practice can help this stress container grow to being bigger. Each one of us will have a different ability to cope with stress. So we might say, well, everyone in the company is experiencing exactly the same level of stress and we're all struggling. But hang on a minute. This person's experiencing that stress and their stress container is overflowing. This person's going, go on, give me more. I'm enjoying this. I want a bit more stress in my life because I'm performing with it. So we could have two people in the same business giving completely different responses because our ability to cope with stress is a very personal thing. So stress flows into our stress container. And like any container, what happens when it gets full? Whoops, it overflows. There we go. And when it overflows, we will often see this, what we call emotional snapping. It's a behavior. It's what we do when things fall apart. So when I, you know, when things in my world fall apart, as I said to you, I will either go and buy cake, apologies, waistline, uh, or I start swearing. I can f and blind along with the best of them. Okay, that's my behavior. Now, by talking to you about that, you probably go, oh yeah, when I get stressed out, this is what I do. 
or when this member of my team gets stressed out or my partner gets stressed out, that's what they do. Or my kids, that's what they do. We all have this emotional snapping behavior. It will be personal to each one of us. On the side of our stress container is a tap. And this tap is coping strategies. Now, please note something. This tap is not at the bottom of the stress container. It's not down here where I'm wiggling my mouse around. We all have stuff in our life that goes into our stress container, it's below the tap. It's always going to be there. We probably can't ever do anything about it. Therefore, stop fighting it. If you fight the stuff below the tap, you're wasting your time, your energy, your resources. Ch take a chill pill, as the youngsters say these days. Relax a bit. Give yourself some space. Take a deep breath. Okay, I'm going to, I can't do anything about it. Therefore, I'm going to accept it. I'm not going to allow it to rob me of my peace, my calm, my joy, uh, the, my, the passion that I have for my job. Okay. We then have helpful coping strategies. Um, they might include uh, mindfulness, having a holiday, having a, a rest and recuperation long weekend. Uh, physical activity comes in here. Socializing with friends, with networking, hanging out, being honest with people, having a group of people we can let it all hang out with. Okay. Good nutrition is really important. Having boundaries, learning to say no. A really great website or a, a, a great image um, that has loads of uh, things to, su to suggest to us that we can use to reduce the stress level in our stress container is it's called The Great Dream. And it's by a charity called Action for Happiness. And you can look that up on uh, line. It, it's a really useful resource. And they have a calendar that you can subscribe to that challenges you on a weekly basis, different things that you can do to reduce your stress. And they keep mixing it up. And I know a lot of people who go, OK, what's the thing for this week? Which part of this am I going to do or am I going to try out? And they help us cope with our stress load better. They help us reduce the stress in our stress container. We also have unhelpful coping strategies, which in the workplace may, might include procrastinate, procrastination or avoidance. Um, it might be using distractions. It could be through substances. It could be uh, just getting angry, stomping off. It might be blaming other people. Well, I can't do X or Y or Z because other people have done this. OK, having poor boundaries and always saying yes to people could be a poor coping strategy. OK. So putting that whole picture together, just think about it. We're all in here somewhere. We all have a level of stress. Now, a couple of really useful questions when we look at the stress container. What's in your stress container? I don't want any hands up. OK, we all have stuff in our stress container. You could do this activity. You could draw a triangle on a piece of paper, put X to mark the tap and have a bit of a mind dump of everything that you know that's in your life that's, straight, that, that's uh, creating stress in your life. And you may want to think back to the things that we had on that previous slide about the physical, environmental, emotional, acute life events and chronic stress and go, which one of those or which of those are putting stress into my stress container? We could then look at, at, at opening up to our emotional snapping behavior. What can I do that will help me? We could look at our helpful coping strategies. What am I doing that helps me? What could I do more of that will help me reduce the stress in my stress container? Can I identify whatever's below the tap of my stress container? Go, yep, acknowledge its existence and let it sit there and stop it from stealing our joy. Can we look at our unhelpful coping strategies? And I promise you, we all have them. OK, and do less of them and do more of the helpful coping strategies. These are all things that can make a difference in each one of our lives. And this is an activity. If you lead a team, you could do this with members of your team. If you do it in a face to face situation. OK, when your team is putting uh, their stress factors into the stress container. Please ask them to think of a food stuff they don't like. So it might be this one. OK. You know, some people go, yay, and some people go, oh, and some people go, oh, take it or leave it, doesn't matter. But think about a food stuff they don't like and give them permission to put that into their stress container. If somebody sees that and says, oh, what's this all about? Okay, why on earth if you put Marmite in your stress container? Well, they can genuinely say that Marmite stresses me out and I can't stand the stuff. However, what that food stuff actually represents, and this is what you're giving them permission to do, 
is to use it to represent the stuff that's nobody else's business. Okay, so if I had Marmite in my stress container, you'd go, okay, Sue doesn't like Marmite. However, it could represent any one of a million and one things that are going on in my life that I don't want other people to know about. But by me acknowledging it and putting it into my stress container, I know it's there. This protects people's um, confidentiality. It protects their identity. And it gives them respect to work with the stuff that's in their stress container. Okay. Other questions. So what can I change? What in my stress container needs urgent attention? And while I'm at it, is there anyone who could help me deal with my stress, the stress that's in my stress container? Looking at my, looking at my helpful and unhelpful coping strategies. What could I do more of? What should I do less of? What can I do that's going to put me in a good place? Because as much as we may want to help the people that work for us, um, our friends, colleagues, family, peer group, social circles, if we don't have the capacity within us to deal dealing with our own stress, we won't have the capacity to support other people as well. In the workplace, what is the most, what are we most likely to see? Well, the S on this stands for stress. Does anybody want to guess what the other letters stand for? Is that anxiety? Uh, cool. Yeah, anxiety. And we're talking common garden, almost everyday anxiety. Worries that play on us, the, the worries that wake us up in the middle of the night. Cash flow, projects going wrong, uh, job insecurity. Is this contract going to go through to the end or whatever's happening? Okay. Everyday anxiety. We're not talking about anxiety disorders. Um, I'll come to mental health disorders in a moment. Okay. The T. Guesses of what T stands for? It's the classic one in physics, if anyone's got a physics background here. It's time. So if I take stress, I put in anxiety, that goes on for a long period of time, what does it turn into? It's a mental health condition, it's a mental health diagnosis. Depression. 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 Turns into depression, you're absolutely <laughs> right. Most of us got that one. <laughs> and therefore, what's really important is that we keep our stress as low as possible. We keep open communication to reduce anxiety. And we make sure that when there is stress and where there is anxiety, we keep the time period for as short as possible. Because you put the whole packet together and we're gonna, we will actually create a person in the workplace with depression. Stress plus anxiety plus time equals depression. Okay, I mentioned just now the difference between everyday anxiety. Everyday anxiety is there to keep us safe, okay? It's that adrenaline rush when um, and it, we're about to step off the pavement and a car whizzes past in front of us. It's there to keep us safe. It, it can be perf uh, performance enhancing. So I'm going into a job interview. A little bit of anxiety, a little bit of adrenaline running around my body, a little bit of heightened cortisol at that point is actually quite healthy because it helps me perform better in that work situation. However, if we take stress over a long period of time, the cortisol and adrenaline levels rise. And eventually that can turn into a mental health condition. So how do I tell the difference, for example, between everyday anxiety and it's turning into an anxiety disorder? This is where this word comes in, this word fist, because it kind of gives them a bit of a soccer punch to the chin. FIST stands for frequency, impact, severity, and time. Frequency, how often are they experiencing the way they're feeling? And it usually goes down to feelings. What impact is this having on their life? Is it impacting all life circles? Life circles of home life, work life, and social life. S is the severity. Are they feeling it just a little bit? Or are they feeling it? Oh my goodness gracious me, it's happening a lot. And T, time again. How long have they been experiencing this? Because if I am having many episodes, it's having a significant impact on all three of my life circles, and I'm feeling it severely, it's going on for a long period of time, the anxiety I'm experiencing is turning into an anxiety disorder. The most common anxiety disorder is generalized anxiety disorder. And GPs often will use that to give a person a diagnosis to get them the help and support that they need, which is usually, from a GP's point of view, through medication, with a referral to psychological counseling. Okay, psychotherapy, number of routes for that. 
um, we can come back uh, routes of support shortly. OK. What can we do as business owners, business managers? We need to empower ourselves. OK, we all have mental health, whether we like it or not. It's part of us. OK, so it, it's common. So we need to start talking about mental health more. We need to start normalizing conversations around mental health. We need to get well-being into every management meeting, every team meeting. And I'm using the word well-being there. And we need to get it at the top of the agenda instead of at the bottom of the agenda like AOB. So if we run out of time, we, it doesn't matter. Take five minutes to talk about well-being. On a, on, a, on a scale of one to five, where one is poor, five is great. How's everyone feeling today? Explore what does three look like for a person who says three and the person who's, who's two, what does that look like for you? How can we help? How can we support you? Is there anything we can do to push your two from a two to a four or a three? The ideal goal is we're all aiming for five where we're all in a strong position, okay? What does empowering mean? It means learning the language of mental health. It's realizing that, for example, not all mental health is bad. It's not all a negative because we all have it. It's gaining knowledge about mental health and mental ill health and embracing that the fact that mental health is part of us and the more we know about it, the better because they don't exact. They're not very good at telling us about mental health at school. And we're not very good at talking about it, normalizing topics. You know, when did you last go down the pub, have a drink with your mates and say, hey, how's your mental health doing? OK, it might come out with, oh, I've had a bad day or I'm going through a tough patch at the moment. We need to talk about it more. We need to gain our knowledge. So when per people say that, we know how to respond. We talked earlier um, before we started the recording um, about people who say, yeah, I'm fine. And, and they need to go back and say, hey, what's your fine look like today? My one is fine. Is it round and you're about to slip off the planet? Um, is it flat and you're going to fall off the edge and disappear off the end of the world? Uh, is it star shaped and prickly? It's really uncomfortable. Is it square and blockish? Does it feel a bit like a, um, a beanbag seat and you could just flop out on it or a comfy chair that you're in? What does fine mean today? Fine to me is, an, is another acronym. Fed up, insecure, neurotic and emotionally exhausted. I really want to know more about this from you when you say fine, okay? Um, practice skills to support people. I've got a slide on that shortly and acquire the confidence to use those skills. You will only acquire the confidence to use those skills by practicing. When we're talking about support, sensible organizations, forward thinking organizations have an employee assistance program. It's a well-being program that is for every member of staff. And a lot of organizations, you know, apparently they're not that expensive. I've heard them costing as little as seven pounds a month per employee, but they're the most underutilized resource. And let me give you a little tip here. If you've got a large number of staff members and you want to help keep them healthy, get an EAP and encourage them to use the counseling resource in the EAP because they will get in front of a counselor in seven to 10 days using an EAP. You go via the NHS, it can be six weeks to six months or longer. OK, so I love EAPs. We, um, I'm not affiliated with anyone. There are loads of them around. It's certainly worth investigating. And I'd like to see insurance companies start to say, oi, get an EAP in, particularly, uh, for example, senior managers and part of the succession plan. Because we can reduce our HR budgets by keeping people working. We can keep them working by using the EAP, the counseling resource, and the other resources that come with the EAP. A self-referral system. It's under the IAPT uh, banner. It's an offshoot of the NHS, but it is part of the NHS. Um, if you're in Southampton City, as in the bit of the city controlled by Southampton City Council, it, uh, or over in Dorset, it's called Steps to Wellbeing. And if you are in the New Forest in Southern Hampshire, it's called iTalk. Basically, what you do is look those up on the internet. Um, it'll either be a phone number or an email address. <clears throat> you phone them and leave a message, you email them, they basically will triage you, they'll get a person to contact you back. And based on information on the website, they will triage you into face-to-face -face counseling, group therapy, uh, online CBT, cognitive behavior therapy. There are a number of resources there. The only issue with the iApps is they're all oversubscribed at the moment. They all have long waiting lists. 
but it's a self-referral system. You don't have to go to your GP to contact your local IAPT. And for that reason, some people like going that route. Okay, it misses your GP records. Other resources, good folk in the human resources department, a good HR manager will have done a mental health first aid course and will be able to proactively support people. Health insurance, um, Bupa, Aviva, whoever you've got, where you've got physical health insurance, there's often mental health insurance. Find out what's available. Larger organizations will have occupational health, either a department in their own right or a, an OC Health contract. Okay, no problem, Elaine. Um, there is the GP, there is the NHS, and some people will resort to private counselors or therapists. Okay. How to support a person. Some really key points here. We've talked about listening already. Um, I've mentioned about perception being reality. You need to be genuine, be honest. Tell them that, yeah, I don't know how to help you, but I'm help I'm prepared to work with you to find some help that will help you. We've talked about a whole lot of stuff already. So you're already pre, if you do a bit of research, you're, pre, you're coming into this conversation uh, with some resources available, things that you can suggest to a person. What's important is we have uh, empathy and we know what it's like to walk in their shoes. Remember, it's not about me, my experience and my story. It's about them. And a lot of people uh, think they're helping when they, oh, you know, Rob, when I was in your situation, I did X, Y, and Z. And you should go too and do that. No, because that's making this conversation about me and my story and not about Rob and whatever's happening in his life or, okay. Reflect back what they said. So, um, and, and when we reflect back, we can use just a little bit of it and, and we might say, oh, struggling. Tell me more about that. And suddenly that opens up the conversation. We might clarify what they said. So we might say, well, when you said this, did you mean ABC? And we use our own language, our own words. And if we've got it right, they'll confirm that. If we've got it wrong, they'll re-explain it. So we, they, 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 uh, they will clarify that for us, okay? Really great question. Ask people, is there anything else I need to know? Because so often as business owners, we think about only what's happening in the business, but there may be a whole lot of stuff happening at home that is having an impact on them and their ability to do the job. Use silence. We're really good at filling in space when it comes to uh silence so ask a question and go and bite your tongue go stum. the person will then fill in the silence because silence to a point can become very uncomfortable and use that to get people to open up be patient it can be frustrating in a face-to-face -face situation think about your body language okay when it comes to support ask the person what they would like to happen or what would they like to have change what would they look you know, what would the solution that they want look like? It doesn't mean to say you have to do it, but at least you can consider it. You may be in an organization that cannot make reasonable adjustments. You have to consider reasonable adjustments by law. You don't have to go ahead and do them, but you would need to have a really good reason for not doing them. I'm done. <laughs> Bang on five o'clock. Oh, that was a lot. I was thinking, yeah, I'm sitting here thinking, how many more slides have I got? And <laughs> I have given you a massive information there. Okay. I'm just going to knock off the recording at this point.